Ella Rolfe from BBC Media Action and BBC's International Development Charity. Um, our policy work on fragile states like, like Afghanistan has shown that media can be really important, um, especially in states that are fractured physically, politically, ethnically. But like the rest of the development and humanitarian landscape, cuts to funding are threatening the media. We're seeing increasing take takeovers by warlords. And because the media in Afghanistan has exploded so much in the last 10 years, I'm just wondering how much all the panelists think it's important, especially if we go into all the transitions we've been talking about, and is there a place for it in a declining aid landscape? We're extremely concerned that the sense that our work and the work of other media development actors has given Afghans and is continuing to give them that they are working together from different parts of Afghanistan and across different political and ethnic divides to do something about their country, that could be lost and it could be replaced by extremely incitatory, incitatory if that's a word, um, negative media, let's say. So I'm wondering if the panelists have a sense that that's important to donors and whether it's likely to survive aid cuts. Thank you. And then th there was another somebody behind you. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Britton, Health Prom. Um, I wonder, would like to know what the panel thinks the international community can do to get more truthful reporting out of Afghanistan. And I would add that the international community itself does not come up smelling of roses here. Uh, the instance I would like to give, uh, because I work in this field, is the Afghan Mortality Survey 2010, and its finding that uh, maternal mortality had reduced over 10 years uh, to one-fifth of its level in 2002. Now, that has never been achieved in any country anywhere in the world, and many people have been who, who know about maternal mortality have been saying too good to be true for, since the report came out. Now that report was funded by USAID and by UNICEF and they could well have influenced it for the better. Uh, let's see some more truthful stats in the future, please. Okay, thank you. And um, any more questions over this side at the moment? Okay, so let, let's come around here. Thank, thank you. Heather Saunders from Plan UK. Um, just a question about women's rights and what the panel think the impact of all these transitions will be for women and girls in Afghanistan. Thank you. Um, and given that was so short, I'm going to take one more right, right here. Uh, Davey, Prince of Wales's office. Will the withdrawal of Western troops make it more likely that the negotiation of a settlement with the Taliban will take place, do you think? And if I may, a quick other question about alternative development and opium. Could, could one conceive of circumstances where there'd be a partial legalization of the opium trade as an alternative development source, or never? OK, thank you. Um, Ashley, le let me go to you first. I mean, obviously, pick up any of those you, you feel inclined to. But though, you know, it, it strikes me that the, the, there were really two questions which are sort of media and communications related. Maybe you'd want to. Yeah address one of those, but please, uh, uh, anything you want to respond to? Yeah, um, I'll briefly talk to the media and then some of the other the other things. Um, w to me, media in Afghanistan is one of the great success stories, um, especially during this election season. Um, Tolo, which is now, now massive, it's a multi-country media um, empire that started in Afghanistan, was started by Afghans, is run by Afghans. Um, it held presidential debates around several rounds of presidential debates with the, the top five front runners, and they were widely watched, tweeted about. Um, I watched them myself, and it, it was extraordinary to see that, to see some of the other things going on, not only with Tolo, but other independent startups like Yak TV and some of the others. You're right, there are warlords like. Um, of course, Dostum had his own TV channel. Others have, have invested in media. But that's, you know, having powerful political uh, players buy up TV stations is un not unique to Afghanistan. And I say that sitting here in New York, where there's the New York Post and Rupert Murdoch and all that. <laughs> so I think it is a vibrant free press. It has received significant US and other donor support, which to some degree 
is a little bit dangerous um, because it does need to be an independent press. It does need to be self-sustaining and, and some of these independent and more progressive media outlets have faced criticism because they take um, Western money, uh, which I do think I do think is an issue. Um, but there are other ways to support them. And I think what you also see is a growth <coughs> in journalism. You've always had a tradition of great Afghan journalists, usually supporting Western journalists who then sort of write the stories, um, working as fixers or whatnot. But in the, in the aftermath of, of the tragic death of, of the AFP journalists, you saw the Afghan Union of Journalists stand up to the Taliban and say, for, for two weeks, we're not going to write about anything that you do. And this is the two weeks in the run-up to the election. But it was a way of, of being activists, as well as, as fighting for a free press, fighting for their own safety and security to report. So I would say that, that there are, I mean, this is one of the great underreported, ironically, <laughs> Uh, success stories of Afghanistan is is Afghan journalism. Um, so that's one of the things that makes me hopeful. But you're right; it does need continued support. Um, I would say my major concern to switch to the other end of the spectrum um, in terms of of not success stories, but potential um, potential disasters is is women in transition. With electoral reform, what you saw was um, everyone talking about you know, an election law passed, no one was talking about that that election law reduced the quota for women in representative bodies from 25 to 20 percent. A um, few people report on the number of threats and attacks and intimidation and assassinations, of which there have been many in the past months of women in public life. Now, this is being less reported on because simply it's happening less and less because women are withdrawing. From, from public life. I was in uh, Nangahar and then in the east, and then in Kandahar in the south, and I was talking to female members of the provincial council, and I said, you know, what do you think about the next election? And they said, I don't think we're gonna be here, even if we're elected, how can we come to this office? It will be too insecure, it will be too threatened. And already they're being pushed out very quietly and subtly um, from public life. So I, I really, um, and Human Rights Watch has been incredibly outspoken on this, and I would urge anyone interested to look at some of the work that they've been doing, uh, because it is one of the great concerns that donors are merely paying lip service to and doing almost absolutely nothing to stand up for Afghan women in the face of this intimidation and this um, suppression that they're facing. Um, on opium, uh, just a quick anecdote. <laughs> uh, I think the prospects for Opium are, are great. I mean, it's it's up to some of the highest levels of cultivation that we've seen in the past decade. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of that money is going to sort of minor commanders, warlords, and the Taliban. I don't think it'll be legalized, but it's one to me one of the again the great uh, failures of, of the West intervention that we've spent so much money on poppy eradication, and we're back sort of where we started. So that, with that, I'll just sort of hand it over to the Thank rest you. of the panel. Thank you. It's a very sombre note to end on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Chelsea, do, do you want to respond specifically on this uh, issue of women's rights? Mm. Well, uh, when we asked our staff um, to tell us about their concerns, we also asked them to talk about the specific needs of uh, women, men, boys, and girls. And, the, you know, the needs are very, um, as you can imagine, um, uh, very kind of, Women and girls, uh, women need to be able to um, provide for themselves and provide for them families and, and provide for their families. And we have we heard a lot of concerns about the ability to um, continue their livelihoods, um, job opportunities, um, and concerns around the economic transition. Uh, and we heard similar concerns about the um, uh, ability for girls to um, be able to, to keep going to school and boys to be able to keep going to school um, if education programs shut down. Um, and another concern that we heard that I didn't kind of highlight before is, um, is the issue of, of health care, um, which has really been hit hard um, in particular due to the, to the uh, to in, in high conflict areas. And that, of course, is another key concern for women and girls. Um, so, in addition, I think to the to security, personal concern, security concerns that Ashley highlighted, I would say that just um, um, basic needs were, were really highlighted by our staff. Thank you. So, John. Um, well, I won't say any more on, on women's rights because I think Chelsea and Ashley have covered it, except to say that I do think it's, it's a real problem. It, 
it's going to be a real problem. <coughs> and there's no point trying to hide that. Um, on the media front, I mean, I do think that, that uh, continuing some kind of assistance, uh, the media, uh, as you were talking about, it, it will be important um, because I think if there's going to be any chance of some kind of um, rule of law based um, government in Afghanistan in the future, then having some kind of uh, decent local media may be part of that. But I have a wider media concern too, which is that as the troops withdraw, Western media interest in Afghanistan will effectively disappear. Um, a lot of the reporting we've already had is, has been from embedded journalists with the military, um, being taken around by the military, but partly because that's the only way of getting around in some places. Now that's been a problem in itself because it has given r rise to a lot of what I would call happy talk about how well it's all going. Um, when it's been perfectly obvious that that's not really true. I mean, it may be true in the immediate military sense, but it's not been going well in the sort of wider political sense, um, which is which has led to some distorted reporting. And I think that you know the, the kind of thing that the gentleman was talking about there. The I, I don't know anything about the report you're talking about, but but the, the the absolute drive to say that this this is not all wasted is le is leading to has led to pressure on. Um, the way th the way it's been reported, I think, which has not actually been very helpful uh, overall. But if the media disappear completely, um, or almost completely, uh, the Western media, I mean, or the international media, then um, uh, that will be a problem too, not least in the development humanitarian context. The, the sad reality is that, that governments and publics respond to what they see in the media um, and the, the, the stories they read in the media. If there's no stories about Afghanistan and how bad things are in some places, then the, 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 the funding decline we're concerned about now may be much steeper than we even we fear now. So we do need to have some reporting there. Just to go to the points, the, the more political points which, uh, which, which Ed raises, um, which are not really perhaps appropriate in a sense for this, but just talking about negotiations with the Taliban, I mean, it seemed to me that the... the, the, the the Western strategy got itself in a real mess because they said, we're going to withdraw and we're going to negotiate with the Taliban. To which the obvious answer from the Taliban is, well, why do you want to negotiate with you? You're leaving. Um, you know, we all we have to do is wait a few years and you've gone, and we'll see what happens. Now, uh, when we have gone in military terms, will that make a negotiation easier? Not clear. I mean, I think it will depend on whether the Taliban think they can take over again, um, which some of them may have the ambition to do or whether they think that's not going to happen, so they have to be part of some broader sort of political setup for the future. Uh, I mean, I think there will have to be some kind of negotiations at some stage if we're not going to go straight back into civil war, but uh, it's not easy to see how that's going to happen. I mean, the point about drugs, I mean, the drug story in Afghanistan is so awful that no one even wants to talk about it anymore. Um, and it's not going to be solved through liberalizing anything in, in Afghanistan. I mean, there is a much broader argument about the, the way uh, you know drug policy is in the in the West now is what creates these appalling situations in other countries, but not in our own. Um, so there's a the, the case for liberalisation or decriminalisation, whatever you want to call it, is quite strong, but it's not really an Afghan point. It's a much broader point. Thank you. Let's go to this side of the room now, please. My name is Javed Nader. I work for BAG, which is the British and Irish Agencies Afghanistan Group. My question is about the development in humanitarian debate. Um, I know Afghanistan has been a dependent uh, country on the region as well as international community for over three centuries, I would say. There was a time when Afghan kings went to India and got a lot of resources from there, but when British arrived there, we had to ask for subsidies, and now it is called funds uh, in the development world. But there were also parts in Afghanistan in which uh, people, even before NSP arrived there, had community centers. They had hydropower um, by the run by the community. And there were also parts in, in Afghanistan where people actually developed these kind of self-help groups. And there is a very powerful culture of, of asher, which means um, community work uh, without any uh, complete voluntary work. So my question is that, how much in our development and humanitarian uh, um, debate we have forgotten about the culture development in Afghanistan that allows Afghans to take complete charge of their lives themselves. Uh, would um, our respect respectable uh, panel members agree on this? Um, and spe my specific question is, what have we learned from this and how this can be addressed in the future? 
Thank you. Any um, any more questions over, over on this side? Please, you're very well hidden over there, but I spotted you. This is Farhad Javed. I'm, I work for Mary Stobes International. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there, some of your staff were had concerns about health. I just would like to know what concerns your female staff had about health, specifically. Thanks. Thank you. And any any more, please. Thank you. Um, Ian Nelson from BDO. Uh, we monitor the ARCF trust fund for the bank in Kabul. Um, I think one of the things that is striking me, we've talked a little bit about economic transition, but in my mind, and from all the time I've spent in Afghanistan, there's a reality that it's an aid economy at the moment, and the vast wave of people who are either directly or indirectly dependent on that aid money or on the jobs which are in government, which come from aid, um, creates a sort of Dutch disease situation, which is a bit unreal, and over time will have to change. And I think it does link to the point about um, poppy production. And I, I'd just be interested in the panel's views on, on sort of what the future for the economic situation in Afghanistan is, where the jobs come from, what are the sectors which are going to actually going to transition and make economic development possible. Because at the moment, the productive capacity of Afghanistan is incredibly low. Um, and in my mind, that's really the challenge of the next 10 years is, is moving beyond having an aid dependent. Be, be, Sorry. But your argument is that the productive capacity is low, partly because of the distorting effects of aid on the exchange rates and- I, I think that's things. part of the problem, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, let me, maybe let, let, let's take the, the, the first question, which I, I, think, I think is an interesting one, actually, because we often um, rediscover in development, you know, ideas about community-based initiatives. You're sort of reviving things that have been going on for many decades. And I just wonder, you know, maybe whether that's the sense that some of your staff have in Afghanistan, that you know, there are old institutions that have really proven incredibly resilient and could provide a basis for, for long-term development. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the, the community development councils that I referred to um, before as part of the National Solidarity Program um, are meant to be based on pretty, pretty firmly in, in Afghan uh, long-held traditions of having community governance. Um, and the idea, of course, being, as, as any local community would say, that w we know our needs best and we know what we can produce and what we can do for our community. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, I think the international community needs to better recognize that um, uh, that Afghans have time-tested uh, traditions um, for uh, producing for themselves um, and for uh, uh, creating and filling needs in their own country, and that's something that we need to be supporting um, rather than imposing any kind of outside vision for what Afghan communities should be doing. Thank you. Um, Ashley? Yeah, I mean, I think Jawed's point was an excellent one, and you know, Afghanistan has this strong sense of community and, and uh, s social linkages, which of course have been disrupted by the war, but they've also been disrupted by the aid economy and the way we've done business in, in the country. And, and we've come into communities that have self-help groups and we've said, uh, we'll pay you to sort of uh, clear your own carezes or your irrigation ditches, something that they would normally do otherwise, or we'll pay you to, to sit on an, a, a district assembly, or we'll pay you for this uh, customary role, which we're going to give a new name, and it's a council of some sort. And we've really corrupted the process and undermined it, I think. Um, but I, Afghans aren't passive victims in, in this sense. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. They've certainly taken advantage of it, as, as you would. Um, but with this kind of money drying up, I mean, I really hope, and I, I'd be encouraged in, in, in another setting or at another time to hear Jawed's thoughts about what will happen. I mean, because there's a strong dependency that's been created through community development work where it's done badly, um, as I've just described. And how do you come back from that? And how do you sort of reinforce better behavior, less dependency, more self-sufficiency? And I think that's a question we're gonna be grappling with over the next few years. Thank you. Um, I hesitate to throw the Dutch disease question <laughs> at you, but maybe you want well, to respond. Well, um, I mean, I think that the part of the response to the question is that, that we have been very bad at building on what's there 
or, or taking what's there and, and working with it rather than trying to replace it. And that, you know, we, that's what we've been doing wrong in the political sense, you know, in trying to build systems which are sort of based somehow on Western systems in a context where they simply don't work uh, or don't work very well. Um, and we may have done something of the same thing, I think, in the, uh, in the aid field. Um, I mean, as a general point, I would say, you know, if, Af if Afghanistan is going to be saved, as it were, it will have to be saved by Afghans, not by us. They'll have to do it themselves. Uh, we can't do it for them. Um, we can make it harder or easier um, if we give the aid in the right way, but in the end of the day, it will have to be done by Afghanistan themselves. And, and I think that won't happen uh, until there is some kind of structure which allows a decent good governance in Afghanistan. If there's good governance in Afghanistan, the Afghans are as capable as anybody else of, of, of making things happen. Um, so that is absolutely fundamental. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon, but let's hope uh, that I'll be proved wrong and the presidential election will be a success and the government will come out of it which does have broad political acceptance and can start to work with the local forces in ways which are, mm. which are uh, positive rather than negative. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, aid, aid does distort. There's no doubt about it. If you have very large aid presences, like very large military presences, they distort a lot uh, in, in the things they do to the economy. Not all of it's bad, but it's it's all distorting. Uh, An aid dependency is a real problem um, in Afghanistan as elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure that Dutch disease is quite the right word for it, but but um, uh, I, I think it is there. And I think you know, we the, the more we can get back to. Uh, work, working with the structures that are there, the communities that are there, as we've been saying throughout, um, and letting people help themselves and, and create their own structures, the, m the, the better that will be. Uh, somebody also, also asked about where is economic development in Afghanistan going to come from? It's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, I'm not an expert on the econo economics of Afghanistan, but agriculture is extremely limited because arable land is, land is very limited, and of course a lot of it's taken up by poppy growing. There is an opportunity in the future, maybe in terms of minerals, Afghanistan probably has plenty of natural resources, but no one is going to invest in those until there is some kind of overall political security, stability to allow that investment to take place. Now, of course, if there is a sort of great commodity boom, that will bring its own version of Dutch disease no doubt, to Afghanistan. Um, but you know, there needs to be some economic activity which starts to generate revenue. One of the most terrifying statistics you could look at is the, the cost of the Afghan army and the Afghan police, uh, which we have created, uh, which are you know, billions and billions of dollars which the future Afghan Afghanistan government simply doesn't have, unless the Western aid donors continue to give it to them, mm. which frankly they won't, at least not for very long. Uh, so how is that going to be sustained? I have no idea, but it's a worrying question. Yeah. But uh, but I, I, I do think it, that that is uh, sorry actually may, I mean maybe you want to come back on this because I, I I do think that question is a critical one for this debate mm. because if if it is the case that increased aid reinforces those effects that you describe, I mean it actually suggests you know that a lot of what we're arguing about here, which is the case for increased aid for Afghanistan. No no we're arguing about stopping it falling completely off a cliff. We're no not, I know not I, I know <laughs> we're not arguing for increased aid, but that's, that isn't going to happen. I know, but but the <laughs> but the point you're making, as I understand it, is that the the aid is having such distorting effects that it's stopping the very type of incentives or the yeah. sort of export activity, you know, that might enable us to get development in, into the system yeah. in a in a in a, in a Okay. Ashley, did you want to come in on the, on this one? Yeah, just briefly, because it relates very much to a, a project I'm working on now and a paper that I have coming out next month. We're doing a series of case studies on, on some of these issues, and with the first was in the east of the country, and we looked at, inadvertently, what we ran into was the effects of transition, the effects of this drying up of aid money. We were there as, as the PRT was closing, as local military spending and presence was drying up, and that was really what in this eastern province that's you know the second to Helmand in terms of poppy cultivation 
That's what was really keeping things secure and gluing the province together. As soon as that started to, to dry up, what you saw, and we were in one district, we were talking with elders, and they said, well, we've started growing poppy again, but it's just like a, it's, it's like a pilot. This is how it was translated. It's like a pilot project. We're growing some poppy in our compounds because, you know, the PRT isn't, isn't giving us money for this or that anymore, so we, we have to find another way of finding income. That was one impact. Another was um, on provincial politics and stability, and you saw various power players who had been propped up by, um, again, military money, which they were using to sort of secure their networks and their backing uh, through their patronage sort of relationships, uh, that drying up and things becoming very, very unstable and more competition and power being more diffuse. Um, and I bring this up because I think we tend to talk about this, you know, Afghanistan's had all this money, it's a bubble, then it's going to fall off a cliff and we don't know what's going to happen. Right now, we're seeing what's happening, and I think we're getting some answers uh, to, to, to the, the question of how it's distorted the Afghan economy, security, uh, politics, development. And it's really, really important to pay attention to the trends we're seeing in these kinds of developments and the way that people are responding to what's going to be a, a really seismic shift um, so that the international community can, in turn, address those before they become security problems, before they become really major economic problems that affect the lives and livelihoods of Afghans. So I would say that, yes, it's been a bubble. Um, it's going to be a very, very hard period, but it's very important to analyze and pay attention to what some of the negative impacts are so that the international community, if it acts responsibly, can mitigate some of them, which is the best we can do right now, I think. Thank you. So um, I'm going to take two very brief questions if there are la last questions please one, one here <laughs> one, one there uh, oh, okay oh, okay i'll do three but you, <laughs> but you have to keep it short um so my name is chris kinder i'm a trustee of afghan aid I, sorry i'd just like to make one i guess one one comment and one question so the i mean the comment is just absolutely to reinforce the positive um, comments that have been made about the NSP program. We're also an implementing partner for NSP. And in terms of a delivery mechanism into remote rural areas that can deal, handle security issues, that can handle corruption, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, that is a delivery mechanism, I would say, which is second to none. My kind of question actually relates to corruption, that if you're, inv uh, you know, anyone who's engaged in sort of fundraising for Afghanistan, the first question is, is, not putting, is this not just good money after bad? Is it not just rife with corruption, et cetera, et cetera? And I'd just be interested if there are any views on the panel as to what could be done to just reduce the levels of corruption in Afghanistan. Thank you. Uh, Jack Fleming, uh, British Army. Uh, so my question relates to, uh, the, well, I'm just interested in the panel's views on how the Western militaries could have better bridged the divide between NGOs and uh, the armies themselves as both work towards transition. Thank you. And then there was one last one here. I'm Magdalena Nikolaus Copernicus University. I'm just wondering how the crisis of international aid might influence the logic of behavior of Afghan political elite. As we know, at the moment, uh, the core part of Afghan uh, political elites are basically comprados who are capturing uh, uh, international aid. So um, I would be really curious to listen to your comments on that. Thank okay. you. Okay. So what, what I'm going to ask you to do now is uh, I'm actually going to try and allocate the questions. <laughs> but, if, but please, if you, you know, if you if you want to answer other ones, but. Um, Actually, I, I wanted to ask you specifically the one that, that was raised by, by um, Jack from, from on, on the British Army, which is how um, the military could have better bridged the divide than... Because I, I know you've worked on this, which is why I'm throwing it at you. But if, if you'd also <laughs> like uh, to use that as a lead-in and then uh, either comment on other questions or, or sort of give us some concluding remarks as well. Yeah, I mean, I and a, a former ODI colleague, Saman Haysom, did a, a paper on this uh, last year looking at the past 10 years of civil-military interaction in Afghanistan. 
And of course, I was with Oxfam and in civil military meetings on the ground uh, some years ago in Kabul. So I have sort of a lot of perspectives on this. Um, I think the military really wants to see NGOs as, as working together. We're all working towards a common purpose. And I think the moment that you know that that sentiment is uttered NGOs recoil they don't see themselves working to the same purpose as, as the military they want to be separate they want to have a distinct role and, and they don't see themselves aligned uh, with any military strategies or uh, objectives of course it's true I think everyone wants you know the well-being and security uh, and better outcomes for Afghans but we both have NGOs, I should say, and the military have very, very different visions of how that can be achieved and then ultimately what that looks like. I think it's also important to remember that humanitarian aid agencies, they're not on the military side, they're not on anyone's side but the civilian population. And in order to serve the needs of the civilian population, they're going to talk to, work with uh, any number of, of actors and belligerents, not just the sort of pro-government side. Um, so I think that's, that's the first thing I pick up on was the military trying to see, you know, NGOs or aid agencies as part of their strategy to sort of clear whole build or win hearts and minds. Uh, NGOs immediately, I think what we saw was a violent recoil and a vicious response of attacking the military in return, saying absolutely not, um, because they need to be perceived as impartial in order to work and to be accepted by, by the Taliban, by whoever. Um, so that's one thing. I think allowing NGOs more space, um, having dialogue, of course, about what's going on, but, but respecting their role as, as quite separate would be the one key thing that if I could communicate to all militaries <laughs> who do stabilization, it's, you know, they're not part of your strategy. The, the, what you want from them and what you can expect from them reasonably is a level of dialogue and exchange um, about what's going on, about how you can share an operating space safely and those kinds of things. But to respect that independence and impartiality would be one thing. Um, just very quickly, on the political elite question, I'm so glad you asked that because that's what I'm working on now <laughs> um, and what a question I'm trying to answer myself through uh, work at ODI, through what's called the Secure Livelihoods Research Consortium uh, in collaboration with an Afghan think tank called the Afghanistan Research uh, and Evaluation Unit. And we are looking at the behavior of political elites at the subnational level, regionally, the sort of warlords and commanders and, and power brokers and how uh, their behavior is changing. Certainly, they have less money coming in uh, from special forces, from ISAF, from other other power players to, to support what they're doing. And I think a lot of them are also turning towards state institutions, really looking back at and seeing what they can capture. We're seeing this both with the security forces, especially at, at local level and at national level. And that's that's deeply concerning that, that these power brokers, many of whom came up through factions in the Civil War, are seeking to capture different parts of the Afghan government in preparation for what they see as either a coming conflict or a, you know, a, um, a splitting up of the government among various power brokers. Um, so we shall see, but it, it's, it's deeply concerning right now, and they're certainly turning towards uh, their own individual survival strategies at the moment. Thanks, Ashley. Um, Ch Chelsea, I, I actually wanted to ask you a question from one of our online audience, sure. um, and it, it sort of relates to the, to the, to the question that Chris raised, uh, um, where he was very positive about the NSP. But the online question is, or part statement, part question, is that NSP is only one aspect of community development in Afghanistan. Could you comment on how the international community can best support district level decision making uh, and service provision? Mm -hmm. So um, I think, uh, you know, all of this is about um, making sure that uh, um, that there's support, um, that as an international community, we're not just giving support um, to, to one place in Afghanistan, but we're also making sure that we're supporting um, uh, provincial authorities to help ensure that, that they're able to implement programs on a provincial level, on a district level, and a, and a village by village level. And I think that's something that um, we can continue to focus on uh, in the lead up to this year's uh, 
a conference on Afghanistan, which um, which the the British government is co-hosting or or co-organizing, um, and and that's to just think about the ways that um, the government of Afghanistan, that uh, donors and and other members of the international community um, can can work together to make sure that. Um, that at the local level, people are getting the funding that they need, that we're working together to identify what people's needs are, coordinating um, so that there aren't gaps in programs, there aren't any overlaps in programs. Um, it's all part of kind of a, a, a holistic response, I think. Um, and and uh, to, to, to uh, come back to Chris's question about, um, about corruption, um, you know, again, I think this is, this is a place where um, as we are, as an international community um, with Afghanistan, we're planning for the future. Um, we can, I, I think there's, there have been great efforts to um, recognize where uh, aid has gone wrong in the past, um, recognize where we have not coordinated well and we, we haven't monitored well, um, and to improve. And I think that this is a great opportunity um, to keep doing that. Um, and, um, and I think also on the, the corruption point, um, you know, one of the, the ways that, um, that the IRC um, uh, follows it, uh, you know, really rigorous monitoring and evaluation, um, uh, it's, its own monitoring and evaluation procedures is to, to um, be accountable not just to donors, of course, but to local communities. And, and I'm sure that's a strategy that you use as well. Uh, because when communities have, um, have buy-in into these programs when they're invested in them, it's just less likely that, that money's going to escape um, because that's, um, this is, these are programs that they want, that they're invested in, and that they're helping to lead. Um, and just to come back quickly, I know there was a question about, um, about women-specific health concerns. And unfortunately, I don't have a detailed breakdown for you, but um, I'm sure you've already read it, and I probably shouldn't plug another report, but MSF has a great report. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, on health needs in Afghanistan this year, which I would recommend that people read, and it has very detailed analysis on that point. Um, but you know, I think we do know that um, there have been significant improvements in uh, reducing maternal and infant mortality, um, and and part of that is these kind of local health approaches that um, train women to be midwives in their own communities, and that's the kind of work that that needs to continue. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, I, I was going to fire the one that corruption <laughs> on you, but it's, but it's partly been addressed, but please, any... Well, any let me just, maybe a couple of words on the corruption please, point, yeah. uh, which is very difficult, uh, and you're quite right, that is a question that all people are going to ask a lot, uh, and we have to be honest about it. I mean, the corruption is not going to disappear in Afghanistan. I mean, if it didn't disappear with all that massive Western presence, it's not going to disappear when we've, dis when we've disappeared. Uh, it may even get worse uh, in some re respects. So we have to be realistic about that. So how do we deal with it? I mean, I think there are ways of, uh, and th that's why community-based aid programs you know, can be one way of avoiding simply handing over money to the central government or even big institutions of local government when you don't know what happens to it. Um, so we, we need to pursue those ways and use the kind of evaluation methods that, that Chelsea was talking about. Um, but I think we, you know, we also sort of have to recognize that there are going to be there are going to be problems um, which we can't stop. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. I was going to say something else about it. Uh, it'll, I'll come back to it in a second. Um, can I just talk about the, the military point as well? I mean, I agree with everything that, that Ashley was saying. Um, the only way to do this better is more dialogue. Uh, and I, my observation was that the dialogue, there was dialogue there, um, both in Kabul and at local level. Um, but it's quite tricky because military contingents rotate rather fast. Certainly the British ones did. I mean, every six months, I think. So by the time that, that, that a contingent had been there six months, they kind of got it. <laughs> then they disappeared, and you had to start again with the next lot. Um, I mean, of course, aid workers rotate as well, so we have our, our own uh, continuity issues. But I think you, there needs to be even more intensive dialogue at local level. But I think there needs to be much better dialogue before people go out so they, they understand what they're going to be getting to. And I think there's, a, there's, there's room for some more structured method of engagement between, for example, NGOs and the MOD on a regular basis so that these, these, these issues are understood on both sides much better than they are now. Uh, the Pentagon do that, actually. I mean, they, <laughs> they have their own problems, but there's, a, there's quite a big dialogue goes on between a, a consortium of NGOs in, in the US called Interaction and the Pentagon fairly intensively and quite difficult and, and confrontational at times. 
and there isn't really, I think, quite the same thing um, in this country. So we should we should do that so people have, are more prepared for what they're going to find on the ground and don't have to learn it all from scratch uh, by, by starting again. Um, and I can't remember what I was going to say about corruption, so I'll stop. Um, I'm sure you remember <laughs> it over the glass of wine that we're going to have immediately yeah. after this. Yeah. Um, I, I, I so just the point I, I, I have remembered, <laughs> that we just need to be very careful. I mean, it w we want to avoid giving money to the government. What we don't want to do at the same time is disempower the government uh, and create you know, what you was called in Haiti the Republic of NGOs. Mm. Uh, so you do have to work with the government, accepting all the risks of that. Um, but if you're going to do that, donors have got to accept that those risks are there as well. Because if they insist on no-risk um, um, contracts and so on, they don't exist in places like Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, and, and therefore you'll finish up disempowering the government and making the situation worse, not better, which is a very difficult balance to strike, but that's what you have to try and do. Thank you. Finish that? Yeah. <laughs> that was excellent. Um, you know, the, the thing I'm really struck by as a non-Afghan expert in, in the room is that, um, you know, that often when you have these debates on aid, we, d we, we tend to be very reductionist. You know, you get good aid, you get bad aid, you get fragile states, you get non-fragile states. And, and actually, the, the real world is just horribly complicated. And, you know, you have to work through difficult governments, you have to work through local communities, and, it, and it's just tough to do. And, and I think, you know, what this sort of meeting does and, and what we need to take from this meeting is that we actually need to inform a sensible public debate about Afghanistan so that it stays on the agenda, you know, in a way that's meaningful and doesn't get reduced to, you know, are you throwing money down the drain because someone's corrupt in the country? Mm. And it's a challenge for all of us, now, you know, and, and I think and hope that we'll all work together in, in taking that, that forward. I, I think the report that we're, we're, we're here to launch is, is a real contribution in that sense. So... A huge thank you to IRC and to you, Chelsea, for, for coming here to, to do the presentation. And to David in, in absentia. Um, Ashley, who's not quite in absentia, who's uh, s still in New York. Uh, Ashley, a huge thank you to you for a really brilliant con contribution. And, and John, thanks so much for, for being here and sharing your, your, your thoughts with us. And, and thank you to all of you. So I, I think I'm right in saying, mm. where's Claire, that we, we have, um, there she is, we, we have some snacks outside, is that right? Great. I didn't want to offer you snacks and then have to <laughs> <laughs> desperately retrieve the situation and possibly get mauled. So, uh, so th thank you so much to everybody for really fun meeting. <laughs>